We're about to go on the record, Scott. So any more? <laughs> Nothing this week. All right. All right. Maybe next week. Why don't we get started? Call the meeting in order. All right. We got Tom Duster is here online with us today. Oh, he's here. Uh, Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Dan Wolford. Here. Uh, Kim Houston. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Hope Bartlett. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. Heather McIntyre is here. Um, John Gage. Here. And Councilmember Mark Mayer is not here yet, but Chair, you have a quorum. All right. Thank you. Um, approval of previous month's minutes. Any questions or concerns on last month's minutes? I did notice that I um, inadvertently left attached something that was attached to the October minutes. So that attachment of the legislative um, guiding principles should not have been with the November minutes. So we can take those out. Anybody else? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Please start saying aye. 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 <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. Um, the flow of the St. Lane uh, line gave this morning was uh, 2.8 CFR. Wow. The uh, 125 year historic average um, is 16 CFR. Um, the reason for that change or the difference there is it's so far away from pouring water. It's up above, you're pulling about 13 centimeters down. And that's not measured against uh, the line gauge. So it's, it's about average. Um, so the call on the sink rain is the divide reservoir, and uh, it's a priority date of uh, um, the April 1st of 1879. South Platte River follows the Riverside Reservoir with a priority date of uh, 1980. Um, Ralph uh, Price Reservoir at Mutton Preserve is an elevation of 6397.5, which is approximately two and a half feet above ground, or approximately Development activity. Uh, maybe you can talk to us. I I had a little confusion. A is not an action required, so yeah, we don't we don't have any de uh, development activity this month. Um, Roger noticed that the structure of it is a little bit different, and it has been since we started using the um, agenda software that we've been using for for a while. Um, there's not really a way for us to do an, in another indented one, two, three under the different um, categories. So each item is listed out separately and in parentheses it tells whether or not it needs action review. So like here, we don't have any in either of those categories. But if we did have multiple properties or something that we were, we were looking at, it would say the title of the property and then um, action required or for information only listed at the end of that. I hope so. Everybody understand that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Wes Lowry. So, yes, uh, I made a uh, cash and loot. Um, so, just going to go through a kind of a summary of where we're at today and um, then hit Q and A, share a little bit. Um, as the board may recall, back in March of last year, um, City Council took action based on uh, Water Board's recommendation to 
set the current fee for cash in lieu, which is at 48500 based on the entire cost of providing a full acre foot of water to the city's portfolio. More specifically, um, it was determined at that time that the Wind Gap project would be used as a principal project representing that methodology. So we've been, you have been looking at that ever since then at your quarterly meetings. Um, as you may recall, the current fee of 48.5 is in two components, one at $30,000 per acre foot, which um, is based at the, the water, the parent project water right valuation. And then the second component, the 18,500 was the cost of the Wind Gap Farming Project. The sum of those two projects, total cost 48,500 would have gone acre foot of water to the water treatment plant. So that's been in place uh, for going on close to two years now. As we look at those two different um, um, elements within that uh, determination, we drill down a little more specifically into the Windy Gap uh, project back in 2022, the same the same year when uh, Council last um, set the current fee. The Platte River Board um, authorized uh, their staff to sell uh, up to an additional 10 allotment units of Windy Gap, and they. Uh, this year, in 2023, earlier this year, they put out an RFP to for the sale of five of their unfirmed Windy Gap units. And they put that out in June, and then later that year, or excuse me, with a caveat that the minimum bid that would be accepted would be $3.8 million per unit. Um, so they received their bids, they received a total of, total of it was five bids for eight units. Uh, they ranked those in order of um, the bid offering. Uh, the top three bids were selected, and those three bids represented the five units that they were pushing to sell. So the, the, the next step in that process was to go to the Northern Subdistrict Board to receive their approval to make to um, authorize that transfer. So in December of this year, back on December 7th, uh, the Northern Municipal Subdistrict Board reviewed and approved uh, the requested transfer of uh, two units for the Town of Berkman and one unit for the Little Thompson Water District. So those three units represent three of the five. The other one will be going to their board sometime um, likely in the first quarter of next year. After the board acts, then the staff can move forward with those entities and actually developing a closing and having a closing that would transfer those, uh, those units. So as of right now, they kind of, if you think of it in steps, they, they're kind of on step three for, two, for three of those units, that being the actual setting a closing date and closing. The other one is like on step two, got to get the board approval, then they can set the closing and close and uh, close on. So similarly, um, like if you were buying a house, is off and you do a uh, uh, real estate appraisal. There'll be some bid, some information you'll have that'll represent um, contracts that are ready to be sold but not finalized. Um, then you'll also have ones that are finalized. And so um, as we look at these particular bids, um, we believe, staff believes it would be, um, it would make sense to wait till those closings occur. Because if for any reason those bids don't close, then they may, then the staff would have to decide if they're gonna look at a lower bid. And um, so the, the idea is that it's expected that, um, and hope that all five units will have been closed in the, within the next quarter, although it could be uh, sometime in the first half of 2024. Um, the, from what we've been told is that once those bids, uh, once those closings have occurred, 
Ben Platt River will share with us, I'll say more details of what those um, closing amounts were. We know that they were at least 38, the equivalent of, of uh, 3.8 million because that was the minimum bid. Um, but that being said, it's expected that the weighted average for those selected bids will be around 41,500. So um, as we jump to the Windy Gap Firming Project, um, as we've talked about, there's been settlement costs from the lawsuit that we've had to work through and some other, other efforts, and those have increased to the uh, amount of approximately $1,000 an acre foot. So that would adjust the current 18,500 to 19,500. So if you take the two new expected costs of 41,5 and 19,5, it's expected the total project cost in order to deliver a firm acre foot unit of windy gap water to the system will be approximately $61,000 an acre foot. So that's kind of the numbers behind it. Um, Staff is recommending that any future cash and new adjustment though be based on actual values attributed to the total projected Windy Gap project cost and that final closed sales be used as part of that calculation. So not just speculation or not what we can actually have closed sales. And uh, so we're of the opinion that it probably doesn't maybe make sense to make a, have a recommendation for a change until those happen. But um, that recommendation is certainly here for you to make. Um, we're going to continue to monitor what the Northern Board, uh, Municipal Subdistrict Board, reviews, and we'll continue to have conversations with Platte River. But it'll, it would be likely your next quarter we review what we have. Hopefully, those core sales information. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, say, um, as far as bringing in, I mean, how will that those costs? I mean, those. Finalized of the cost, final addition of those costs about, I would think, what, another year or so? About a year and a half, yeah. But now, are you saying, you're not saying you want to wait till the final before we adjust this? Okay. So what you're, what you're referring to is one, so there's two parts, the parent project water, the water right, the windy gap water, and then there's the chimney hollow firming project. So what you're talking about is a chimney hall firming project. Yeah, that's going to take a couple years to complete. There's already money in the reserves to help pay for unexpected overage costs. It's possible those could go up. Those, if they do, are going to be a, a much smaller value. It's going to be something like that thousand dollar an acre foot type of increases, as opposed to the value of the parent water, which is based upon whatever the market is, and that's where it's went up from the current. $30,000 an acre foot to what's going to be projected to be around 41 five. Okay. Yeah. Questions? I was going to say, I think at the last board meeting you talked about an outreach program that you guys had probably started. Yes, has there been like uh, anything given to council that would lay this out like you've done here for us in a study session or executive session just so they're aware of it as well as develop as a So, so we, we do plan on doing that. We're not at that right point now. yet. We've actually um, been asked internally to, to look at additional options. Um, also, there's a there's a little bit of concern about how um, cash and lieu will affect affordability uh, in the community, and also. Looking at what future projects we may use. Now, currently, or at least cash and lube we've been accumulating for some time now, we used um, a bulk of that, four and a half million dollars, when we uh, entered into the contract with the Windy Gap Permitting Project. Uh, we, we used the remainder of the Pine Mountain Dam Fund, the, the four and a half million. Cash and lieu. Um, we had uh, a bond that the uh, citizens had uh, approved, and then some money we had already in the state budget. We had a consortium of money that we put together um, to, to 
pay for that. Um, the biggest item in that, of course, was the bond. And so that bond will have to be paid off. And so we will, we will use some of this cash and move it. Um, it gets to be part of the cash and move to pay for that bond. Um, right now, um, we're being asked to look at different alternatives. And, and one of the things I wanted to do is I'll put <laughs> Council Member Horton on the, on the spot today, I apologize, but I would kind of like, so, so we've heard, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to listen to a, a lot of stuff. We're, we're reaching out where we can, and we're, you know, we're reaching out really heavily to our planning department because they're the front line working with the development community. We're reaching out to um, our um, economic development partners, and our economic development part of the city. So we're reaching out to that and then wanted to work with the water board and then work with town with the council. So um, actually anything that you could give us, <laughs> any thoughts on, on that whole sub, that whole, I guess about the whole affordability of what, what yeah. council's thinking about on that. I guess the, the thing that we, we would say about Wes's analysis is that it is the kind of analysis that a public utility would do and be limited to in in terms of, of their rate setting, right, and sort of cost plus. And what that, what, what Les went through very capably is what it costs us to get that water from our primary water sources. So, um, there are a whole bunch of other policy things that this council will look at before setting the final fee and move. Um, and Ken just hit on, on the big ones, which are what are the city's needs, right? How much, um, what, what are the things that the city is gonna have to use the fund that, that those fees go into for. So if the city's needs are really urgent, we might want, especially if there's high demand for the water, we might um, want to set that price higher. Um, What's going to be the rationale for that? The rationale is that we need stuff. Okay, in other words, we're not a public utility. We're not limited in our policy decisions to cost plus okay. at all. There are a whole bunch of other policy matters that um, I don't know whether this board should be in the business of, of analyzing them or not, but uh, we can tell you that the council is in the business of analyzing them. Um, one is just what other municipalities are charging in the same position. What is the, what is the fee and move for, um, you know, really when it does an annexation um, or Johnstown or any other municipality um, that's big enough to have a water department. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and what we found the last time there was a major change in the fee and move formula is that we were way down at the bottom. Way, way down at the bottom, like a factor of five difference between Longmont's fee and move and everybody else's. And we're still on the lower end of that, although this, nobody else changes this 61, predicted 61 would put us much more in line with other, with other cities. Um, but then we have to figure out what the policy objectives are the city and how much that fee and move um, affects whether you know, the transition transactions that people developers particularly make with the city enter into um, are are impacted by the fee and move. So if the city's policy is that it needs more development no matter what, and we need to annex all the land we can then we might want our fee and move to, to be as low as we can afford to keep it. You know, I don't think we would want to be letting land be annexed below cost. 
right? But we but we might want to go with the this at cost or or a, a narrow cost plus kind of a policy. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of people, a lot of voters, and if you really you know analyze the results of the last election, um, there are a lot more voters than there were last time around who don't think Longmont should be growing as much as Longmont is growing. And that would translate into a policy of really jacking up the fee and lieu because more developers would go away and develop somewhere else. Um, and then there's, again, the, the affordability uh, idea of, well, yeah, we want to develop, but we want to develop um, a lot of housing that is lower cost, whether it's subsidized housing or whether it's not subsidized, you know, it's naturally affordable to more uh, people below the average income. And that would be a good reason for keeping the fee and lieu low. But there's a catch there too. The council can <clears throat> have a policy, which we did last time, of discounting the fee and lieu uh, in exchange for a covenant with the developer that they're going to produce affordable housing. Um, so there's all kinds of knobs that go into the determination of what the final fee and lieu is going to be. And at least some of those should be considered um, by this board. For example, a, a, a survey of what other municipalities are charging. Um, a discussion with planning about what kind of applications they're going to get. An inventory of what the annexable land is. You know, one of the one of the things that has um, uh, been observed right now is that all of the land that is left in or adjacent to the Longmont planning area is hard to develop land. Right? You know, we've got we're we've got we're awaiting the outcome of a of a uh, lawsuit for the Campbell Estates parcel, which is not hard to develop land. It's pretty much porn land, you know, but but but, but it's hard to get. <laughs> You know, we have to, we're, there's a fight over that land. Um, and then, you know, there's the sugar mill area land, which is the epitome of hard to develop land. It's blighted, it's polluted, it's, you know, it's a mess. Um, and there's no infrastructure even adjacent to it. You know, it's, there's all, all of this blighted land inside the city limits already. Um, so we're, we're pretty much starting from dust if we start to develop that land. Um, have you have you heard from developers recently that the expenses of doing business in Longmont? Have you heard much of that? Oh, we always say that. Well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> no, you know, no, you know, like Longmont's way out of the range of anybody else in the area. Or, no, no, I, no, I no, not, no. They're not I saying. I think they could say that. They can, they can't say that. You know what? What compared to oh, oh, Frederick or somebody, you know, that's, that's just trying to grow as hard as possible. Can um, we're probably harder to work with, you know. We've got bigger land use code and bigger development code, and so you know yeah. you have to toe the line in order to get your project through the process. And that that gets said a whole lot. Gets said a whole lot that it takes too long. But I don't think anybody has ever said that the city won't work with us. Or that this that the city's costs are out of line. I mean, everybody in this area, the cost of land is out of line with respect to the United States of America. Um, but um, but but for our area, no, I don't think I don't think that's true. I'm just surprised that it's happening. Yeah. Well, um, so. So I heard somebody say the other day that the that the city ate up too many of the low income. Uh, housing tax credits so that their private low-income housing development was going to have to wait longer to get some. Um, but I mean, that seems to me like uh, whining, you know. <laughs> I mean, 
everybody's everybody is, is dipping out of the same bucket. There's a lot of labels and buckets not very big. So uh, uh, I'm not really advocating for a policy because I only speak for myself. Um, you know, I don't think we should leave. My personal opinion is we shouldn't leave money on the table for um, commercial developers, um, but we should make allowances for affordable housing. And we already did that. You know, last time around, we, we um, the policy now contains a, a reduced fee to the rate if, if, if there's a covenant to build affordable housing. So. Um, I, I just wanted to talk about all the things that need to be considered. And I think at least all of the factual information needs to be brought forward by the staff and by this board. You know, so we, we need, we need a, all of the stuff about what's happening in the surrounding area. You know, um, it's, it's up to the council to, to tweak the quantitative analysis, I think, to decide uh, whether we're going to, you know, we're going to incentivize affordable housing, whether we're going to incentivize building in Longmont or not, um, you know, all those things. Um, and, but it's not up to the council to go and figure out how much all the other municipalities are charging. It's not, it's not up to the council to go and figure out who's buying and selling water rights and for what. So all of that stuff needs to be looked at. Um, and, you know, maybe a trend analysis, because, you know, there's no, re you guys are professionals and you're adjacent to the business mm -hmm. in one way or the other. The council's not professional in anything most of the time. And, <laughs> you know, so we don't do stuff like trend analysis, <laughs> right? Um, that, needs, that needs to come, right? That needs to say, well, you know, um, water rights are getting more and more expensive um, with respect to the cost of living, or with respect to the cost of land, um, or not. Good point. Good point. Tom, you got any comments? Um, I, I have a few, but I don't know that my voice will know. I, I just kind of, um, I just continue to advocate for the fact that um, I feel like it is our board's job to uh, find out how much it costs the city to buy an acre foot of water and um, all the kind of additional kind of planning, uh, almost kind of pseudo political kind of stuff is really not up to us. Uh, and that um, and I would just kind of, you know, the, the professional role that we hold is just to figure out how much water costs. And I don't, I don't even know that um, what other municipalities are charging for their free and new has really anything to do with us either because that's not our city. So, um, in our city has a unique set of circumstances that, um, that, that result in whatever the cost is for us. So, that, that's, I guess that's my two cents. Okay, uh, thanks Tom. Uh, anybody have any more comments? I have, yes. I have some questions. Um, one of my first questions is you guys were doing outreach to developers at one point to let them know that there would be an increase? Not that there would be, but that, 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 that the data was suggesting it might be, yeah. Uh, right. as, they, delivering. as they've been going through the development review process or they contacted the contacted our okay. division. So when they contact you, you let them know that there could be a change? Yes. Okay, how's that going? Like, do you have a sense of how many you've done, what percentage of folks know? Is so, it well known in the development community? Has it been outreach to the to the impacted community? Yeah, that's a good question. So as you've kind of seen through the development review that you've looked at, there hasn't been a lot. Right? So even since the March of 2022, since the last change occurred by uh, for Cash and Lou, there's been a I'm going to call it a limited amount of development that's went through that's required water board action on. And a lot of that has to do with right prior to council's action in March of 2022, a significant amount of cladding that was sitting there and even annexations. So just a quick refresher, when you annex in the lawn, but you transfer your historical water, that leaves a remaining deficit. At that time, you can satisfy all remaining deficits of pertinent to that annexation. 
you don't have to wait until a flat. Most do, but you don't have to. So when the bigger change came about um, a couple years ago, some annexations came through and satisfied all the remaining deficits, which therefore allows them to develop at their own time frame, whatever it is, without having to bring more water or create more heating flush in winter. And so, and then there was a bunch of final plots. So that, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was a significant amount of the developable uh, land within Longmont. So in the last two years, there's been some development proposals that have come through that have had some outstanding deficits, um, but on a very small scale. Somebody that's got, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make up a number for illustrative purposes, they may have less than five acre foot of deficit. So as opposed to somebody that's coming in and has a 150 acre foot of deficit, a significant impact. And so um, there also, is, another point is there is a handful of developers that represent a significant amount of the development that's going through Longmont currently. So in other words, there, I'm gonna, and I'm making this number a little bit up, but it's, I think you'll get the context. There are five or six developers that probably represent 80% of the development that's going on right now. And we've had conversations with those. Yes, there's gonna be other developers that just come through, because in any given time, a developer can walk into the city's uh, uh, development uh, building and say, I wanna have a, have a meeting and talk about a project. But I think we've had a lot of conversations that are, um, everybody, th those people that are in the development process now, we've had conversations that represent that roughly 80%. Um, there's an expectation, they, they just understand costs go up with time. It's very unusual for costs to go down. So as they go through there, they're doing their own performance, they're like almost expecting it. Not, not wanting it, but expecting it. And so that's kind of the conversations that we've been having so far. Great, great, thank you. Yeah. And I would expect that you guys are communicating with planning staff and economic development staff, and you're not directly interacting with developers, because again, anything you say is can counter Intuitive of what's going on in all the planning. So you know, you're just kind of guiding the ship through other city staff. That's right. So we've had right. we've had very specific conversations with um, the planning staff. There's been a pretty good tip, turnover of new planners, and anytime that happens, I've had more direct, um, comprehensive discussions with them about cash and lieu. And so what's been happening most recently is those clearinghouse plan planners are suggesting that the applicant directly contact water resources. So something doesn't get lost in, in transition. So I've had and continue to have a lot of direct one-on-one -on -one conversations with the planners when they, or the developers when they come, come through. So, um, and, and that process can take a while. So even though, even though there, you haven't seen development applications in front, doesn't mean there's some in the pipeline. They're just not ready or at a point yet to come before the board for taking, taking action on it. But I think we're gonna see a few of those in, uh, in the near future. Yeah, um, I'd like to maybe draw the distinction that, that Tom was trying to make a little differently. Um, because yeah, it is not this board's charter to make policy. That's the council. But the council is not chartered to do sophisticated data analysis. The staff and the advisory boards are supposed to bring that forward. So, um, you know, as, as I recall, the last time we did this, we went through this exercise in a big way. Um, we had, uh, you know, a, a, an incremental same formula recommendation that came from the staff and the water board. And we had people, public water, uh, public society, you heard, pounding on the table and saying, Longmont is charging a fifth of 
what all the surrounding cities are charging, why are we leaving this money on the table? And what we had to do as a council was send that question back to the staff. And it would be great if we didn't have to do that because that, you know, the, the, this is the thing, Roger, to the, your previous question. Developers hate uncertainty because every time there's uncertainty, it equals de delay and it means that they've had to finance, because they have to get their financing uh, lined up in advance, and if they can't finance, they can't, they can't even do an application, you know? So um, they, they just hate uncertainty, and so the faster, when we begin this exercise, the shortest time possible from, from taking up the question until settling the question, the better it is for everybody who does transactions to the city. And therefore, bringing forward, you know, doing the data analysis, because, you know, I can tell you, the, the council um, is not going to be the best people for deciding what all the factors are. You know, they're not, okay, you know, there's one council member that goes to the Wibby Gap meeting and eats the donuts and hears about the the litigation and stuff. <laughs> hey, Brian Bagley thought those donuts were the only reason they were going up to Berkeley. So, <laughs> you know, but um, but most of the council doesn't even know, you know, that, that there are legal issues to be dealt with, let alone that they're going to impact the cost per acre foot of a firm. Well, I've used up all my words already, you know, so the, the cost of the water per acre foot um, out, out, of, out of Chimney Hollow is going to be impacted by those legal fees. So all of that stuff, all, the, the questions are that the staff and the board knows how to ask those questions. And the, at least the data and the potential impact need to be part of the package that comes forward. What the council does with it, yeah, that's policy. Like that's right, that's whether the council is still committed to more affordable housing or not. That's whether the council is still committed to reasonable planned growth or whether the um, the council leans more toward capping growth, as some city councils and other cities on the front range have done. Um, you know, that's that's council policy. But, but the data analysis that informs the policy making process is, I, I, we're going to depend on this board one way or the other for that analysis, and it's just a question of how many managers it takes. Okay. Wes, anything else? No. You know, I had one question, and I thought when we first started knowing that this cash and move aid could be adjusted. Was there a thought that maybe the water could, could be able to make a decision sometime in December or did that, was that an optimistic thought? No. I think that was probably more optimistic on my part. I, I think I led the board to believe that, I, and I thought that they were gonna have closed sales by the end of the, end of the year, but it's just taken longer mm -hmm. than expected and so Again, that's where our recommendation comes to, it seems to make sense to let that play out so we can know for sure what those sales and therefore today's value of that parent water is. I have no problem with that. It's going to take longer than I thought about. And then on, on top of that, staff would like to be able to bring back to the board and then eventually to council some of the data points that we're talking about. And we have done that in the past sometimes in Bruton, sometimes we don't on you know, survey. It was that a long standing survey we've done for 20 years since the other cities and what their policies are. It hasn't been updated yet, so you know, things like other cash and policies. It's not as easy as saying this city charges this much, this one pays this much. I mean, it's, it's like a matrix. <laughs> all kinds of, you know, everybody does it differently. So. 
but yeah, we can we can update that. We, you know, we one thing we would like to do is kind of goes back to the question about, about you know, how much is out there you know, and how much development might be to do. We have a, a long, a very long-standing uh, GIS map layer that we occasionally bring in the water board, and I think we'd like to bring that back to you and show you. It, it has by parcel by parcel. Yeah, partial by partial in the entire city. What's annex? What's not? What's fully not historical? What's what's fully met? What still needs to be met? It, it, you, you can't granularly go through it, but it, it gives you a good visual, a good base of information on. So those are the kind of things where over the next couple months we're going to try to bring back, and then possibly have enough information <laughs> on the table for the March. Review. So yeah, I do appreciate all your input now, and then you know the suggestion, and and we agree with it that we do need to do a study session with council to really kind of think through because there are broader policy issues. I mean, we we're good at bringing the data to you, <laughs> but the policy you know is, uh, advice. Uh, we appreciate uh, the board and council. Do that, so we'll we'll continue to bring more information. <laughs> right, that's what we would suggest. Anybody else? Oh yeah. Move on. Oh yeah, I could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> I could talk about this all day. We haven't done all day. I'll try to make it short. Um, but when I was reviewing the numbers that are in the current packet, I will say there was one thing that jumped out at me that, that was slightly concerning, and that was the um, the the current proposed or somewhat proposed um, windy gap firming costs of uh, 19.5. Those are below like inflation index, um, meaning they're too low. I want them to be higher. I mean, I want them to be real, but I think we should also be aware that those should go up probably at least another $1,000, which is not a big piece of the puzzle. It's a smaller piece, but I think we should be making sure that that signal is out there. Um, and, and that's just comparing to indexes, okay? But when they're not going up as fast as the construction cost indexes, then I'm like, hey, is this number still good? Um, and if we're going to delay even longer, I think we should be aware that that number should go up, potentially. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm sure. Um, and then another thing I wanted to communicate to you, I guess, to council, is that um, avoiding rate shock is lovely, meaning keep the increases small and steady. Um, I'm hearing there's, you know, let's not do it now, but I, I think reviewing it frequently and small increases that are more frequent sometimes can be better than a big jump mm -hmm. and more palatable to whoever's experiencing those increases. So just as part of the stuff to keep in mind for future reference, if we want to do a market-based thing, we could pay somebody to evaluate the market for us annually or every other year so that these things are going up more incrementally. More incrementally, but also maybe frequently. <laughs> you know, keep it going um, so that we're not behind. Because I, I don't advocate for that, but just it helps things be more palatable and workable for the developers. Because as you were saying, they know things are going to go up, and if they get a feel for it, it's going to go up this much, it, you know, or it's if they can expect these increases annually, you know, we're looking at two years now if we're going to do this in March. If we were doing it annually, maybe it'd be smaller steps and more palatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that's a really good point, and it's kind of the thing with the council seldom questions. It's kind of meta policy, right? How often do we evaluate this policy about policy? Mm -hmm. And the council usually is not quick enough on its feet to question that. Uh, so I think an annual review of SDC or cash and move might be like like annual inputs of something bigger mm -hmm. is potentially useful if we want to go with market. Maybe the staff is hating me right now for suggesting that. Right? Well, they, they but, may be. But, but also, maybe contract out. Give them some money to get it done. Um, you know, so that's just for food for thought. Yeah, and then there's a, there's another thing that because if we do it more often, then now now you're shorter than the planning cycle for a development project, and so then you're going to have to say, well, which de which develop which which of the development pipeline is affected by this and which is not. When it's two years, then it's a little, it's an, it's an easy 
their question. Well, and one of the things that's always kind of troubled me on the water board is, is when we advise on a different cash and loan, we advise this month. And, you know, if somebody doesn't know that advice is coming in this month and when that exactly lands to council in the following month, all of that stuff, that's another thing about annual that's lovely is if it were truly annual and they could expect it, then it wouldn't be, oh, shoot, I should have gotten it in last month, which sounds silly, but if we're talking about increases like this, that's going to stink. Oh, yeah. right? You know, so if they kind of knew to expect, hey, it goes up every April or, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. Then at least they could be like, well, I want to try to get it done by March. You right. Know? So, so giving that normalcy, as you said, meta around it so that it's normalized, that can help too. Yeah, and we just had that theoretical discussion uh, with with respect to the um, feeding rule of building affordable units last month. So. Yeah, it's, that, that's really real, and, and it, it makes a big difference to developers. So, yeah, anything that we can do to regularize the process, and and it, yeah, part of the problem was because of the pandemic, we didn't we didn't readjust that uh, fee assessment as often as we had promised we would. So we were behind, and that was big time. So that's a good thing. Anything else? Is there? Not right now. Don't be snappy. Not snappy. Okay. I, I'm going to say that I did look at all in system development charges on a per unit basis for multifamily, and we're not that expensive. We're fairly inexpensive. We are, and that's kind of compared to, to stuff around. We are a little bit more on the spendy side for single family, but that's not necessarily where affordability lies in my book. In my day, so. Mm -hmm. Both. Both are cancer. Yeah. Just one quick question on process to ask. When a developer deals with his deficit, he's done with it. He's before planning. He's done, right? At that point in time. So it could be three years before he does that development. So and in between that time that he's settled that deficit, cash and move is increased by he doesn't have to then He's done. Okay, right, that's a big win for him. So yeah, so that's okay. so we've had some annexations. Do it now. That have been yeah. satisfied yeah, for uh, <laughs> twenty years. Mm -hmm. There's been no okay. development, and the cash and move has changed twenty yeah. times up and down. So that is an advantage of for a developer. They, they told me and that's why some of them have came in because it makes it, if you will, more marketable. If you if you can sell it knowing. To whoever and say to the potential buyer, regardless of what happens with cash and lieu of water rights received, you're satisfied. You're done. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a great point. I, I don't remember if we saw this last time, but maybe we did. Um, I'm not aware of the 20 times up and down in cash and lieu. I thought it was fairly static for a really long time, and then we had a pretty big jump. So if there's a historical trend line of what cash and lieu was over time, it'd be interesting to see. So you can go on our, on, our, on our website right now, and we have a list from 1963 to current right. of every uh, council, council action on setting the fee. So starting at $100 back in 63 yeah. to where it is today, and it shows every change. So we've highlighted it in red. There's not a, a line graph, it's a spreadsheet, sure. but it shows that there was a period of yeah. time where it was changing frequently, where I think we made four changes in one year six changes in two years of cash and loot just trying to stay with the market um, in the early 2000s. Um, Even in, in my time, we've done multiple yeah. increases per year. So usually it's not been huge, and there's yeah. percentages listed there. So you can see, relatively speaking, how big those changes were up or down. Five right, percent, no, I did that. So yeah, yeah it's, it's under. It's I think in the past 10 years, we've done about eight changes. Yeah, so it's about once a year. So not much recently. Right, and, and, and because of the format that we've chosen to base our cash and move on, it's not as responsive to market changes anyways. That's right. Because there'll be cost inputs which don't really track That's market. exactly right. So we shouldn't be doing it every quarter, frankly, because we don't have the data to suggest that that's changing on a quarterly basis, but it should be more than a little bit. Since you moved away from using CBT yeah, exactly. as, the, as, the, as the barometer, as the, we've definitely has changed that right. frequency. Okay, 
Let's move on. How about the Copeland one? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Copeland Link MOU. Yes, um, I have before you a, a proposed memorandum over the uh, management agreement between the city of Longmont and um, the National Park Service, <coughs> Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, the city of Longmont owns 80 acres up in the Wild Basin area of Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, it's just, if you go in the park off of the state county road, there's an entrance station, you got Copeland Lake. We used to also own Copeland Lake, but we exchanged that in the mid 1990s to the St. Rain and left on a lot of conservancy district for golden bonds. Uh, that was a good deal <laughs> for both of us. But, um, but we still own 80 acres, which is really the, the willow car. Um, the, the main part of the valley um, predominated by willows, so we call it willow car. Um, very, very pristine area. Um, we've, we've owned it since um, the turn of the last century. Uh, I don't remember exactly, around 1910 or so, we purchased that property. Um, we filed for a uh, reservoir site. It, it was a planned reservoir site in the valley at that point. Um, in the, uh, around 1915, we actually built Copeland Lake, the small lake there, and it had plans for about 1,500 acres of reservoir. Um, that never went forward. Um, quite honestly, the uh, geologic conditions of site today wouldn't have allowed for it then. And even today, if, if all the glacial till, you got like a thousand feet of rock to call, you know, you would never be able to see like, um, and of course now, being all wetlands, you wouldn't be able to build a reservoir there. So really, we the, the city has not been using it. Um, it's owned by the water fund, but hasn't been used by the water fund for you know, water purposes. Um, as such, in the mid 1990s, early 1990s, we entered into an agreement with the National Park Service where they actually managed the property for us, they treated it, 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 it actually got included in Rocky Mountain National, in the boundary, the exterior boundary, of Rocky Mountain National Park, which it still only has the, it's within the park boundary. And as such, they can manage it, they manage it for us, um, the great benefit for us is that we don't have to spend a lot of money to, to go up and watch the area and do minor maintenance and uh, take care of visitation and that type of thing. So they treat it as if it were part of the park. They basically, this agreement allows them to apply their um, park regulations to the land, which is really great for us. It preserves it, it keeps it um, in better condition. And they have their rangers stationed right there. They, they have their district ranger's house right there at the entrance. So this really, it saves us a lot of uh, time and money from sending crews up there to do maintenance. Um, it's, it's been working really good for almost 30 years now. So, But it needs to be updated. It's a, it'll be a 10 year agreement. So it'll, it'll be from 20, now 2024. 20, Ten years maximum the park can be agreement of this type. So, um, staff is recommending the the um, board of recommendation to council to approve the agreement and move forward with it. So the terms of the agreement basically aren't changing. They really aren't. Um, it, you know, it was rewritten a little bit, but um, but you know, it's everything everything that you would see today will continue up there. Um, and management. Um, really, for for them, uh, it's a couple couple benefits for the park. One is they use that whole willow car as a because it's so pristine, it's such a natural area. They use it for a lot of research, and they're able to actually do some research projects. Um, they're Property is just west of ours, and so the research can kind of continue through the valley. Um, prior to our joint management of the area, um, we weren't able to get there quite enough, so people started camping. And then it kind of became a people were holding further and further and to where they were actually camping on the National Park Service lands. 
and they, they came to us and said, hey, you know, this, this activity is impacting ours. So we, we got rid of overnight camping that's there and, and installed a small day use area. Um, but really for the for the park, a couple things they want. They want to keep the entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park pristine. Um, it gives them uh, really the, the corridor um, for, for, get, for people to get into the park. There's, there's a hiking trail, so a lot of people, are, not the visitors, most visitors are driving in, but a lot of the people that live in, in that area are actually walking the park on the trail. Um, but really, it's for, for the park, it's just, it, it's the entrance to one of the major, well, I personally consider one of the best areas of the park is Basin area. So there's no monetary compensation to them. There is not. Their use able to oversee the land and they see a lot of value in that property. Yeah, they do. The, the, if you read the agreement, it does have, it, there's extraordinary maintenance. You know, <coughs> the Longmont would sit down with them and talk about how to fund that and we, you know, get more likely to fund it. But, um, in terms of really their maintenance is patrolling it. Um, they, they do have work crew, um, volunteer work crews that take care of the trail. Um, there really isn't too much cost for them. And of course, it, one really great thing for them is they actually have their entrance. They're gated, they've got to pay the dollars to the public. Uh, right off the county road, um, it actually, the road goes across a couple of my properties, St. Green up and Water, the Service Lead District property and our property. So it it probably is nice. Otherwise, they'd have to move their way. Well, they wouldn't have to, but it's just awkward to have your gate <laughs> not actually at the entrance, you know, the edge of the yeah. park property. But it's at the edge of the park, which um, so for, for them it's it's a really good deal. And of course they wanna they wanna keep the pristine nature of that. And years and years ago, we actually, about 40 years ago, it was leased by a, uh, a stable uh, who pastured horses out there. So, probably wasn't good. Was this agreement, when was it first put together? Um, first, I think it was 1993 okay. when we first entered, so right at about 20 years. Yeah, 30 years ago. <laughs> <I can't remember. laughs> uh, it was just it's, it's been a while. So yeah, it's, it's we believe it's very, very okay. Good. Sounds like it works. Yeah. Scott? Yeah, I was only going to suggest that in the future, because there is some uh, historical pieces in here, as Ken mentioned, uh, in the agenda, we called it a Copeland Lake MOU. We should probably not call it a Copeland Lake MOU, since there is a Copeland Lake MOU that Service district has with the park service True. for that particular parcel, mm -hmm. just for confusion's sake. So it's really just a willow car. Should be Copeland Willow Car. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Other than that, I, I would make the motion to um, authorize the city to enter this agreement, or for the recognition, city council to authorize the city to enter the agreement and substantially inform, presented the water board as presented to us. Second. I'll second that with comments that, you know, it makes sense for one entity to do the ecosystem management. So two different entities, it certainly at times have different priorities. The other thing that I'll mention to the board too is you know, after the flood, the restoration of Button Rock, the city did a wide number of cuttings of those willows from this property in order to do the restoration of the Button Rock. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a really good point, Dan. I probably should have mentioned the the about 35 acres that we exchanged the district by adjacent our acres. The district also has a, a, a MOU with the Park Service, so the park would be managing not only the park but both our property and their property. So that is a good, good point. In relatively the same manner, the agreements are not that dissimilar. You know, but they're under. Yeah, I agree with your suggestion. The only reason I would know exactly where this is is because it's Copeland Lake. What do I get? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I it makes no sense idea where it's or whatever it is, but no, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a point. geographic point. It's just that there are yeah. two separate agreements with two separate. You're right. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Just for keeping the minutes. Okay. We have a motion made and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Unanimous. It's passed. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, you're up next. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I don't have to take a whole lot of time here and detract from the, the water resources side of the conversation, but um, it's great. I think Wes initially asked that I introduce myself. So I know some of you just from working with some of you, Dan, um, and uh, presenting at some, some of the, the council meetings. But um, uh, I'm an engineering and operations administrator with the city. I think one of the things that Wes was hoping I could cover is just some of the reorganization across our water and waste services department. So Chris, I don't know how much context you provided as to kind of how our department has been sure reorganized. That we have a lot of context. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, historically, I feel like public works was really headed by Dale Redmaker, right? And so he, a lot of decisions and work went through Dale, um, you know, one person. And, and as we've kind of reformed into this water and waste services, department, um, some of the vision was to create some um, kind of management and supervisory, uh, I'll call it resiliency within the group, right? Um, so uh, Bob Allen currently is the department um, director. Uh, Chris is the assistant director. Uh, myself, I'm one of the administrators, and we have one other administrator, uh, Joe Mahalski. And so among the, the four of us, um, you know, we, we kind of oversee and support all of the department functions. And, uh, and really that's primarily our waste services group, which is you know, waste collection, recycle, compost. Um, we have our, obviously, water resources division, our engineering section, which handles our capital improvement program. Uh, we have our treatment operations, distribution and collection, that's utilities, and then environmental services. So there's really six core functions within the department. And then, uh, you know, really two, uh, two of those divisions are, are uh, antied up between myself, Chris, and uh, Joe Mahalski. So I, I think what Wes was hoping I could do is just maybe say who I am as one of the administrators and what function um, I, I help support in the, in the utility. So I primarily um, support our environmental services, part of the, the department, and our utilities, which is our water, um, water distribution and sewer collection. And, uh, and so without going into a ton of detail, on the high level of what does environmental services do for the city, um, others have maybe heard environmental services um, in the past, and it was a more expanded role within the city in terms of what we would cover. Um, it, it's kind of been uh, dialed back a little bit in terms of its scope, in, and it's uh, primarily associated with our water and waste services division now. So what does that mean? Um, you know, our baseline of environmental services is to cover Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act compliance. Those are our two big core uh, regulatory needs for the city. Um, and each of those is associated with water and wastewater. So we cover those. Um, and then another uh, component that environmental services provide for the city is, is really just technical resource to all of the other divisions within water and waste. And so um, what, what does that mean? What does, what does technical resource mean? Just some uh, you know, practical applications. If there's a challenge at the drinking water treatment plant, let's say there's uh, you know a change in water quality, or you know we have an algae bloom, you know that's that's something where environmental services would come in and provide technical resource to understand why that happened. We don't get into the nitty gritty of how to fix it. That's our operations group, but we provide the technical background research. Some of uh, our staff are PhDs. And we provide that technical resource for our water staff. Um, and, then, uh, and then another component, I guess, would be sustainability. So there is some of that partnership that we have with our sustainability group where we implement sustainability type projects at our water and wastewater plants. An example of that would be the solar um, and battery project that's uh, uh, almost complete at our wastewater plant. So that's a, uh, another good example of what environmental services does. Um, uh, Let's see, on the utilities side, that's our uh, water distribution and wastewater collection. So you can think of that as pipelines. So that's another area that I support. And, uh, and so what are the big needs in those areas? And in terms of water distribution, um, I think everybody here has probably seen news of water breaks that have happened 
And I think that that's uh, around the city. Somebody mentioned a service line. It's not the city. That's service lines are residents. Oh, that was a massive. That was, that was <laughs> the main. Oh, it was the main. That's the main. Yeah. Are you a Walmart resident? Yeah. Right across from there. Thompson you go. Park. And it's a it's a very good illustration of one of the biggest challenges for our utilities operations groups and. Uh, and so aging infrastructure, I think, is going to be something that gets brought up quite a bit with council over the, the next year, especially as we start doing rate studies to understand where are the costs within the utility, what are our biggest challenges. That is going to be the primary hurdle for a water distribution group is we have tons of cast iron pipe in, in the city. And not every city has a lot of cast iron pipe, but cast iron pipe primarily was installed in like the 60s to 80s. And so that infrastructure probably doing it in the back of your head, right? You know, 50, 60, 70 years old, that, that infrastructure is prone to failure. And so we, uh, we have a water um, you know, rehabilitation capital improvement program that our engineering group manages to replace that infrastructure, but is it being replaced at the frequency that we need? That's um, an assessment we're doing as part of our rate study that we'll, um, you know, council will see probably in the next, uh, the next year here. Uh, that's, that's a big consideration for distribution. And then on collection, I mean, aging infrastructure, again, same problem, right, on the sewer side. So if you think about it, water lines are being laid, the same time sewer mains are being laid. So that infrastructure is just as old. And we have a little bit of a, a more cost savings um, type of method to rehabilitate sewer mains. You can do that trenchlessly by lining pipe, whereas most of that infrastructure when it comes to water distribution is more expensive. We're pulling up the road most of the time for that. We don't have the same technology to do that. Um, in, in a more cost-effective manner, uh, but but rehab, rehabilitation rehabilitation of the collection system um, falls falls within a big uh, part of that that work, um, and then you know you all have been talking a lot about development, right? and the impacts of development, cash and made. So uh, you know the collection system uh, was designed at a time when Longmont may have been planned differently, more commercial, more single family, and as we continue to add density which we're talking about for cash and lieu financing, that's a consideration for collection system capacity. And we continue to analyze the system through flow monitoring to understand, did we design the system for the amount of you know, development that we're occurring in the city? And, uh, and that coordination, again, is with planning uh, quite a bit. Just to say, okay, where, where is the development happening? And is our infrastructure adequate to, um, to densify? So, uh, so just another area of utilities that I help support, but we have plenty of engineers and good field staff who are also tackling that um, quite a bit. And Chris, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Um, I, no, just, I just wanted to point out to you as well, uh, John did a great overview of what we've been doing and how we reorganize. Uh, one of the things that happened when we split it up out from public works and natural resources, you know, obviously uh, the parks piece is separate from uh, our group now, uh, but we work with them. And the storm drains piece also got pulled out from the public works. So public works streets and storm drainage. But because of the way that we worked in the past and the way we're set up now, we have a lot of overlap. Um, so uh, we, we are, as Joe presented last week, uh, there's a lot of CMP projects that are within the raw water system um, that uh, we're trying to look at the system holistically and not say, well, we're just doing water line replacements or we're not just doing sewer, we're not just doing storm line, we're not. It's all working together and we're looking at it all holistically. I just want to point that out. Yeah, yeah. So each of uh, us and maybe that kind of leadership team support each other and have different experiences that add a lot of value. So even though I support our distribution and collection uh, teams, you know, Chris has had a lot of experience with development. And so another how does that work, right? What's the application to say, how do we support each other? Well, one of the big challenges for utilities is development when uh, you know, you, contractors want to bore new lines for fiber, for um, you know, whatever underground utility they want. And they strike, potentially strike, our underground assets. Well, we, we work really hard to not that. We, yes, exactly. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. And so uh, Chris has been helping us, I think, work on the development side. Um, being our advocate there to say, how do we better protect our underground assets so that contractors have some, some boundaries and safeguards in place that don't hit our uh, the city's assets? And so he's been a really great resource to help on that. Do you core drill at all 
locate existing? Is that a mandatory thing before? Yes, there, there is state legislature that uh, anytime that it's the city has a contract with a, either a contractor or a designer, they're required to help pothole up, uh, hire a, a pothole truck to turn our streets into Swiss yeah. cheese to locate everything. Value. Um, so we, we work on both sides of that. Yeah. Uh, make sure that we are locating everything as best we can. Bill so yes. how do you interface with water, water treatment plant? I mean, are, is there any tie or is it? Yeah, great question. So, it, I mean, water and waste is cradle to grave water, right? So we have <laughs> we have water resources. There's no grave. We read. There's no grave, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so cradle to the water. Sure water. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's 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 yeah, so it, it goes. Um, so environmental services, right? As I was saying, kind of support can support technically our our treatment operation staff. But within water and waste department is our water resources, water treatment, water distribution, sewer collection wastewater treatment. So everything, all the way through the system of water life cycle um, is within water and waste department. And so our operations group is uh, led by Jim Halski, um, and then we have uh, you know, supervisors and treatment and operations managers who are you know, overseeing those individual operations. Great. Any questions? I'm I'm I know I'm I know I'm last hand. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Down the primrose path, um, how close is that solar plus battery project? Because it's been hanging fire for a long time. Oh, and yeah. How many megawatts, or what fraction fraction of a megawatt? It's fraction of megawatt for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 smaller, and it, it has been a uh, um, the batteries installed it's on site, and so mm -hmm. is the solar. They're working on the integration of the two now to understand how those are working mm -hmm. together um, in terms of storage capacity, offsetting peak demand. Um, so it's definitely not a project that we're touting as a megawatt type project, but mm -hmm. um, what it is is a, a really good demonstration project that LPC has has even um, you know offered some funding assistance to get better monitoring approaches on. So when we talk about distributed energy resources and the BERS, this is what we're learning, right? Is how can we be offsetting peak demand? So our wastewater treatment plant has a very high peak demand that's associated with one of our aeration processes, and so the as much as we can time the uh, discharge of the battery into our electrical system at the same time that we're using this high demand aeration process we can start reducing the, the grid load and that's that is what we're learning as part of that process but it's definitely not a offsetting the whole wastewater plant no no no, no. i'm listening yeah, yeah. <laughs> no I, it's, it's a kilowatt uh and I'm, i i don't know off the top of my head the, the actual size of the battery some some number of kilowatts correct you have something, Dan? I was just asking, John, are you coordinating all the federal permits for like wetland mitigation and stream restoration and all that fun kind of stuff? Are you the go to guy? <laughs> Chris and I both look at each other for that one. Um, I, I am not specifically the go to guy. Environmental services, historically, maybe that's we're speaking from experience. Um, you know, when Cal Youngberg was leading the environmental services group, he, he, I think, coordinated a lot of that work. As Chris was alluding to with these different departmental changes, um, environmental services is working to coordinate with our stormwater group specifically to keep that kind of technical resource in house. Um, and so folks can come to environmental services for assistance, but I wouldn't say environmental services is the, the lead now. Like yeah. everybody, lastly, all the project managers will. We create my first call. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, we, we do have uh, different staff in different areas now with uh, the contract and with, uh, like you said, expertise in house. You know, there's an article in the paper. Did we treat less water this year than previous? I think Chris was <laughs> quoted in that one. <laughs> Ken was kind enough to allow me to be quoted. <laughs> uh, He'll do that. Last year we had in 100 years, right? Yeah. So we don't need to treat water when it's wet. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. We already did treat. Uh, there was about 2,000 acre feet less this year. Yeah, thank you all for letting me come and share. I know. It's like, it's going to make my programs that are really good. That's definitely <laughs> perfect. Say <laughs> it. What's your next one? All right. 
Um, so I'm presenting to you all um, the Growing Water Smart um, Impact Report from 2023. This is different from the water conservation programs as a whole. This is just the Growing Water Smart um, program. So as a reminder, the Growing Water Smart program is a program that um, we're that I'm running to create a path forward to foster an equitable, safe and resilient community that contributes to Colorado's sustainable water future. Basically, it's growing, developing water supplies, changing codes, making sure that we um, implement water efficiency strategies during development instead of post-development. But since we're not there yet, we're working on our post-development water efficiency strategies um, with the largest project being the Kensington Park Grass to Garden project. Um, I presented to you all in, I think, just October um, with the photos from the actual event, but here are some hard numbers. Um, we had 131 community volunteers. Uh, we also treated this event as a resource fair, so we had seven resource groups participate um, and 354 water-wise plants planted. We also gave away 99 plants to the community. Um, so that they can start their water wise garden in their homes. Um, yeah, so that's the Kensington Park project. But um, the Growing Water Smart program itself worked on several other projects this year. Um, we did a code review for resilient landscapes, and that is basically a comprehensive review of the city of Longmont's plans and policies to assess our codes and policies for water conservation, water efficient landscapes, and climate resiliency. Um, the aim of this project is to identify best practices, policy gaps, and opportunities for improvement for efficiency standards with the water lens. We're meeting with our um, consultant tomorrow, actually, to go over the first draft. So we're really excited that this project has started um, growing some fruit so uh, we we're hoping to present to council some code changes um, for water efficient landscapes specifically in the spring. Um, we are also doing a turf replacement plan. So um, we're working with the Water Now Alliance to do a, um, a plan for us to establish data-driven targets for reducing non-functional turf on city-owned properties. Um, we met a couple weeks ago to do a, a workshop um, to discuss co-benefits of turf transitions with a variety of different city staff members from different departments so that we make sure that all, um, all groups are being heard so that we don't unintentionally affect someone um, when we pick uh, turf replacement projects on city and property. Uh, we also are doing the leak notifications. Um, so this ties back to a WaterSmart grant that Francie received um, several years ago um, for our AMR water meter infrastructure. Um, we're required to do notifications to um, customers who have continuous usage on their in their meter. Um, this is the first year we were actually able to like start sending out letters, so that was really exciting. Uh, we sent out about 400 letters, um, and our call team made 200 calls, our customer service team, so really thankful for them. And um, we found three City of Longmont leaks that were found end result, and just from those City of Longmont leaks, um, we saved 1.3 million gallons. Um, so that was really exciting. And then last but not least, we did our water loss audit, which is the N36 from the AWWA. Thanks to John's team um, for his all of their help. We couldn't have done it without them. There's no direct water savings realized from this report, but it's really crucial in understanding our system losses and kind of where we stand with that. So um, we're, we'll look forward to continuing that report and making sure that we keep our docs in line. It's gonna help you guys identify your CIP projects, hopefully. Um, 
And then just a funding summary. So the city, for just our Growing Water Smart program, we set aside $15,000. We got a $25,000 state grant from the CWCD for the Turk replacement project. Um, and then in between other grants um, for our Water Now Alliance project, the code audit, and the water efficiency plan um, is that 80,000 additional dollars for um, Growing Water Smart projects. Um, and then in 2024, looking forward for Growing Water Smart projects, we're going to be doing a, a more in-depth city leak procedure um, with the, the ops team. So making sure that we get our city leaks taken care of more, um, more efficiently, more timely. Um, the code updates, which we're really exciting for, really excited about, and um, and then a couple more turf replacement projects on city city owned properties. The uh, one point five million gallons is that a twenty twenty three? Twenty twenty three. Do you know what the number was for twenty twenty three? We didn't have any growing water smart projects happening in twenty twenty two, so this was. What we, from January to now was 1.5 million gallons saved just for growing water smart projects. So the gallons did you save, Marcia? For me, it was my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I had a, you know, I had a, I got a new smart roof, and the roofers squashed all my new, uh, <laughs> new perenn native perennials. Throwing stuff down off the roof, so I, I used a little extra water in there so I didn't have to have this. But. <laughs> That's common space. Yeah. <laughs> Just curious. Anybody have questions before? Um, so the code review is very exciting. Yeah. Um, that has, I think, potential. And I, I love the idea of trying to get stuff done right rather, rather than retrofit. That's smart. Um, so I guess my question is, is there any way Waterboard can support and Help with code reviews. Like, if you want to do presentation to us, we could give a sample of approval if we do approve. That yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be really helpful. Once we get our second, I'm actually not the project manager for this. Um, our environmental and sustainability planner is managing the turf or the um, code review for the growing water space project. So he'll come and present to you. Okay. <laughs> That'd be great. Once our plan moving forward is to meet with a consultant tomorrow get for our first round of edits. When we get that kind of trimmed down version, he's going to get it to his leadership for like their, for their drafts. We're going to give it back to her and then we'll come to you guys before we go to council. And then obviously having you all stamp of approval when you go to council is really valuable. I'd, I'd love to know more about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was super helpful. She she reviewed all of our um, development plans too, so all of our comprehensive plans from Envision Longmont to our water efficiency plan, and outlined everything that had the word water efficiency in it. So we yes. have all of that in one place, which is really helpful. Excellent. Um, and then water loss is also really huge. Yeah, that's one of my favorites because water loss is well, no, it's like one of the conservation measures that's also revenue positive. So like, how would I not love that? Right? That's like two favorite things, conservation and revenue. Um, and so having them both happening together is not that common. So yeah, I'm excited about that too. Is there any way we can see results of that? You sure. said it's done. Can yeah. we send them out maybe if that's yes. cool with everyone? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Do you guys track water loss on a monthly basis? Is that something that's reported internally in the ops group? We have uh, slow loss Yeah, we, we have flow meters. Um, located around the city, uh, which are primarily used for you know, larger leak identifications. Um, you know, in instances where we have main breaks, and uh, it, those are, are measurable pressure losses within the system that we see pretty pretty quickly. But in terms of water loss accounting on a routine basis, we use those larger uh, flow meters throughout the city to do some, some accounting. Um, you know, this, I think what you'll see in the report when you guys see this water loss reporting is it's looking at the entire city as a whole, right? And uh, and so there there could be large leaks that are caught by those big flow meters in our transmission zones, but might not catch all of the little leaks sure. around the city. Yeah. 
And so that that is an important piece that you know this water accounting says is like, are we falling within industry standards? So that's why I was going to say. Just, yeah. I have no idea what one month's system losses are for its water system or yeah. how that measures up and so forth. And, uh, and yeah. it plays it plays into you know infrastructure rehabilitation. Because yeah. So when we talk about older lines throughout the city, that's primarily where you're going to be seeing leaks. And so as, as we continue to replace old leaking infrastructure with new watertight PVC versus you know a corroded um, you know, cast iron pipe, we're going to continue to see water losses go down over time. But it speaks to that importance of not only protecting public health, but you know, reducing water loss throughout the system. And we increase that uh, that work over time. Cast iron beats lead, right? Uh, what did you say, Marcia? Uh, I don't know, let's say that for you. We don't have any lead anymore. No. no. They never brought any lead Sean, I should have asked you, you know, when you were talking earlier, um, but you know, when I was out there with the crew, obviously it was a, a small enough break to take and smooth it, right? And you have to pay off and replace. But when you guys start thinking about replacing linear miles of infrastructure, it's not sleeves. <laughs> no. But what does that look like? Because i got to imagine that that's. No, it's expensive. So if you take a, a linear mile of cast iron pipe out, you get the plan for that, you have to cap the cost. Correct. It's not gonna be fast, so you're gonna have a lot more in the lakes there. In the past it's been about a million dollars a mile. Right. So it's I mean is it, so when you're talking about replacing vast portions of old infrastructure, that's a twenty five year plan, thirty year plan. I mean it's not it's a continuous and right now we're trying to go through a prioritization process to find uh, where we get the most bang for our buck. Uh, but as you know, John had indicated, uh, in sanitary sewer, we've got a lot of options to do internal repairs. It's just not as cost effective. The, the methodologies that they have to really prepare them to do internal repair of anything. Uh, so we have the caps on the, the, the services. We are always looking for new technologies and find those tools. Tom, you got anything? No? I let myself unmuted. Um, no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, thank you for the information. It was, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. That was good, good information. I hope so, too. Thanks for the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, on number 10, review the major project listed and item 10 of the schedule for future board meetings. Any comments? Anyone wants to schedule with that? Okay. Um, uh, we have no information items and water board correspondence. No, there's not none. I'm just reminded it was in there, but as as it has been in the past, it will be the fourth Monday in January, not the third Monday in January. We have to the observance of water in there. Okay. It'll be January 22nd. January 22nd. Okay. I did send out those calendar invites too. Well, well, I was so concerned to accept them because they had so many weird ones that went out last year. I'm like, yeah, I just know they're probably the dates out. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Should have had three for me one for did, January, one for February, and one for the rest of the year. Um, all right, I'll, I'll accept them. <laughs> but I didn't. If they come from Roger, don't accept that. <laughs> don't from me, I recognize that. Everybody's on this Any comments on item 12? Any other comments at all? Happy holidays, we're adjourned. Yes.